Thanks for listening to the Women Emerging podcast. Every week we put up a new episode with insights into leadership, practical leadership, seen through the eyes of women leaders of all ages and all sectors from right across the world. Our aim is for women to be able to say, if that's leadership, I'm in. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and join Women Emerging on our website, womenemerging.org. That's womenemerging.org for more fabulous free leadership content. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the Women Emerging podcast and I am Julia Middleton, your podcast host. This is the third in the series of episodes where we talk to fascinating women leaders about the things that they've learned about leading and for each thing that they've learned they choose an object that somehow illustrates it for them. Two weeks ago we started with Utara and I shall never ever forget the moment when she brought up that certificate from the government of Kanataka where that proved that she had adopted her son and what that taught her about leadership. And then last week, Paula showed us that beautiful photograph of her, I don't know, must she have been about 20, holding a cat in her arms with a, a mass of books on shelves behind her, talking about the moment when she left Argentina and had to leave her cat and her books behind. And what that taught her about leadership. So... Stella is this week. Stella is totally irresistible and her, her objects are utterly ridiculous. Firstly, there's a chair, not so ridiculous. That's just the moment. It's just, it captures all the learning that she got when, as a woman in her late 20s, she became vice chair of the HIV and AIDS Tribunal of Kenya. We'll let her explain that to you it's fascinating and then her second object is her tattoo and she sort of opens up her arm and this is long long tattoo all in the shape of a heartbeat it's a long one along her arm i'll let her explain that too it's a heart beating and then she's got her glasses that are almost as colorful as mine but slightly bigger so i'm a bit jealous and then there's a picture of her mother, her mother, who didn't have an easy life, and how much she learnt from her mother about Lily. And then her last object is her red fingernails, and they are strikingly red. Just you wait. So, first object first. Let's go. What is your first object? Am I looking at it at this very moment? You are looking at it. My first object is the seat. I have two seats next to me here. And they are a representation of some of the most important work I've done around social justice and human rights. And this is a sitting in as a vice chair for the HIV and AIDS tribunal, the only such tribunal in the whole world that adjudicates on human rights violations, matters touching around discrimination and stigma for people living with HIV or those affected in education, in housing, in employment, in healthcare, in even access to public housing, public transport, and any other social amenity that exists. When you sat in one of those chairs for the first time, were you surprised to be sitting there? Extremely surprised to be sitting there, Julia. When I was appointed, I was a very young girl, barely 27. First as a board before I was elevated to be the vice chair. And I thought, lots of people play pranks. And I said, how does the president know me? Because my appointment came from the office of the president. And I was being sweared in by the chief justice of Kenya, then Justice Willie Mutungi. And I thought somebody was playing a prank on me until I went for my Supreme Court swearing in and taking my oath that I realized, my God, this young girl who grew up in the streets 
who um, spent most of her childhood homeless and in a slum was here sitting in as a special judge in a special court on human rights issues around HIV and AIDS. But like my soul um, and my body were disconnected because for me, I still saw myself from the vulnerability that I sat on, but also just looking at the opportunity to be able to bring hope and to create an environment where people can live with a smile because their issues have been sorted is something that really reattached my soul back to my body. I still remember that moment at the Supreme Court swearing in and I have the photos and I say, my goodness, if you, somebody would have told me at 12 years old, at nine years old as a homeless child, that one day I'll be at the Supreme Court being sworn in by the Chief Justice, I would never have thought it would be a reality. What did you learn about leadership when you were doing that? I think there are ways in which sitting in that tribunal reignited a part of me that I had not thought about as a leader is leadership has always been looked at as very mechanical you know but sitting there and listening to a young boy we had one of the young boys I'll never forget his name Elijah who was denied an opportunity to go to school because he's HIV positive and the mother needed to leave the drugs in school with the, with the, with the teachers. When they discovered he was HIV positive, they denied him the opportunity. Sitting there with that point saying, I know I'm HIV positive, but I need an education. There's an empathy in me that could a connection around human experiences as a leader that made me find a way to disconnect from the mechanic to actually start to put myself around when we talk about leadership, what does it look like? It's engrossing and immersing ourselves in the experiences of those we lead. It's being able to have, to see them from how they see their own ecosystem, either where they are violated or where they call their homes or where they find community. You know, it's just immersing ourselves through that and seeing through those lenses that I found my deep connection in my leadership pathway. So there's a real danger that we sort of, we become mechanical leaders doing all the things you're supposed to do. Actually, if you look at progressively how leadership has been looked at, like a step ladder of some sort, with certain conditionalities being put around academic qualifications, years of experience, exposure, and those are very mechanical. Anybody can actually attain that, but not everybody has the ability to be empathic. Not everybody has the ability to be sympathetic. Not everybody has the ability to actually love from a, a place of leadership. And part of loving from a place of leadership is actually deconstructing what leadership looks like from more of a hard approach to it, to a softness, a softness that looks at people, experiences people, values people, looks at productivity and products and any output at any workplace as something that is secondary to this immersion of an individual and commitment of an individual to making a difference either in the product industry or in the service industry. And so that's not something that you actually learn from a step ladder. It is something that you actually have to open yourself up to it and be vulnerable to having those moments. Do I remember you telling me that when you arrived at the tribunal, one of the first things that one of your fellow tribunal members suggested to you was yes. that you might get up and make them some tea. Yes. Tea. tea. What, did, what did you do? We've all had those moments, but what did you do when, when he suggested you <laughs> Julia, before, <laughs> before I got my son, I was a very petite girl and I'm a 5'2". Literally, I'm short. My heels save my day. You're shorter than and, me. And, 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 I am I shorter than you. Shorter and, than so, <laughs> and so when I walked into the tribunal, everybody thought I was part of the secretariat. And for some reason, they associated the name Dr. Busire to a man. And so at no particular point, was it supposed to be a woman or a young woman for that sort? And so when this individual asked me to make them tea and gave me instructions, how to make that tea in a way I felt disempowered but I looked at it from a moment of I said this is also going to be my teachable moment around do not judge a book by its cover I am here by merit I was appointed to be here I have earned myself this seat and so I made them tea until the chair of the tribunal walked in and identified me and said oh Dr. Busira I see you're early and even then this individual could not believe that I'd gone through medical school six years of training plus internship and I'd qualified and I was actually already doing my master's and I like are you a doctor nickname 
or are you a doctor, doctor? And I'm saying, I am actually a medical doctor trained in one of the best universities within the continent. And, you know, it took them some time to actually adjust. But a young woman, a brilliant one for that sort, could actually sit in the same spot with the same pattern. You chose to make the tea in the knowledge that actually tea. make him even more embarrassed. Oh, and I'm telling you how it won. And I remember um, I had two very amazing women with me in that room, you know. Every time somebody questioned if my qualifications were legit, I'll never forget Angeline Sipiro and Commissioner Masi Deche. And I would ask, don't you think she has brains? Don't you think she's hand? Why would you reduce her to just being somebody who perhaps it's through connections that they were able to sit in that board? And I'd actually be duly seconded by the medical board which is a regulatory council of doctors in the country and also the medical association where I sat in legitimately as a bona fide member who was very respected even as a young doctor because of the work that I'd done around HIV and AIDS and so it's one of those experiences that I carried on I'm still very short I have my height has not changed my weight fluctuates up and down sometimes I'm very petite and, petite and I enter a room and I can see it in the faces of people but over the years I've learned to be fierce and I've learned to attack them before they attack me say yes I am here and if you don't bring me a seat, oh, I'll bring my own table and a seat and I will sit at the table. Yes. So tell me, go on, what's the next object? My second object is an ECG, an electrocardiograph. And basically it's just the electric activity of a heart. But it's, it's, not, it's not an ECG sign. It's a tattoo. Of an it ECG is a tattoo. Sign. Yes, it let is a see, tattoo. <laughs> It's in, it's on your inner arm, isn't it? It's on my inner arm. It's on my inner arm. The multiple occasions that made me um, have this tattoo. One of the things that leadership struggles with is vulnerability, personal vulnerability. For one purposes or the other one, we come from backgrounds of the one I've come from where there has been struggles, there have been traumas, different forms of traumas. But because life happens, we go collecting milestones and wins and go on without being able to look back about how our work affects us, how where our, our experiences affect us, and even where what I call adverse childhood events. I have been a, a patient of severe depression, despite um, many of my colleagues saying, how can you be depressed? You're one of the overachievers. And I tell them, yes, that doesn't still negate the fact that I can actually even get depression. And so it's just a reminder that even in the work, that I am a human, that I feel that I have pain, that I love, that I cry, and that doesn't take anything away from my leadership. It actually just affirms that I am a, I am a human leader who recognizes all these experiences. And when I bring my own personal experiences at the workplace, one of the things I've actually seen as an outcome, for instance, around mental health, is that there are not a lot of institutions who focus a lot on supporting their team members and investing in it as part of a very important input towards excellent productivity around taking good care of the mental wellness of individuals. And so in spaces I've occupied, I have centralized the care for the institution, both communally and at an individual level, where they can access um, mental health services, either through a psychiatrist or a psychologist, or through their own ways in which they define, because some people do not define mental care for the formal way. They can have their own spiritual way. They can have dances. They can do yoga. Whatever it is, stick their box and brings them um, brings them healing and, and calms them, you know, and makes them show up in their best self at work. It's something I've been able to support. So of all the tattoos you could choose, why did you choose an ECG? It symbolizes life. The moment the ECG, your electric activity of the heart stops, you die. So you die, you die in your productivity, you die in your leadership, you die in showing up, you die in your love life, you die being a caregiver, you die in so many ways. And so a recognition that the human person, you know, needs to be injected, needs to be constantly rejuvenated, needs to be constantly reignited is very critical. And particularly for people who are holding leadership position, that is not, r, &R is not something that has been embedded in leadership. In fact, rest is looked at as a weakness. And yet Audrey Lord says, my rest is an act of political warfare because it's part of work. It's important to step back and 
get healing and get your cup filled because lots of us are operating from a place of our cups are half or our cups are completely empty and yet we're expected to give and give and give. How do you give from an empty? So RNR is very critical around leadership and it has to be emphasized. And part of RNR is around the mental well-being as an individual, communally or institutionally. That is very critical. R and R means rest and recuperation, doesn't it? Rest and recuperation, yes. How do you cope with the fact that people decide that you must be superhuman? I suspect it's happened to you more than me, but occasions people have thought that I was superhuman and treated me as if I was superhuman. And almost they put you on a pedestal and then when you inevitably fall off it, <laughs> they almost blame you. How do you make sure that doesn't happen? I think for me, I've always shown up as Stella, you know, I've always shown up as Stella corporate. I've always shown up as Stella the dancer. I've always shown up as Stella the mother. Stella the bad camper who carries suitcases is, uh, to camping sites. You know, I've always shown up as my true self, as a person who loves cooking, as a person who loves her dogs. I've never showed a part of me that is plastic. I've never showed a part of me that is supposed to appease the masses. I've just shown who I am. And there are places where I've, I've even gone against the grain to not agree with certain popular beliefs because they do not align to my own philosophies. And I have been segregated for purposes of that. And sometimes I've been vindicated, but there are also other times where I have had to learn a lesson. And so in all circumstances, I have still remained stellar, who's learned a lesson or who's made other people learn a lesson. I have refused to be branded a strong black woman, a superwoman. I say, no, I am a vulnerable black woman. I am a girl who loves soft life. I'm a pearl, you know. I love soft landing. I love my head on feathers and, and soft pillows. And that is because I am human. And so for you to actually put unrealistic expectations, and this is something that is very wrong, particularly in women who've gotten into the parts of leadership, is that certain multiple unrealistic expectations are put upon you. And so what you end up doing, you end up compromising parts of you. You end up compromising your social life. You end up compromising your love life. You end up compromising moments where, for example, you love gardening and you want to spend more time gardening because you're constantly leaving to people's scripts. I don't leave to people's scripts. I define, I write, I erase my own script. I take it up as I see the day. I take it up as I see my moments, as I see my own personal experiences. And so, no, I am not a superwoman. I am a woman who loves soft landing and soft life. Why are your glasses an object? <laughs> because I see life clearly. Let me tell you a story about my mother. My mother was a sick um, my entire life. I actually discovered my mother was sick when I went to medical school and had name a disease. My mother was schizophrenic. And so when people talked about normal mothers, there are ways in which I looked at my mother as normal is sometimes she would run naked. Sometimes she would speak to herself. She would have bizarre behaviors. She would dress bizarrely. Personal hygiene was not a priority. And so for me, that was a normal mother. And so when I got my scholarship and I went to medical school, for the first time, I actually named the disease that my mother had, which was schizophrenia. But for me, it wasn't just a medical disease. There are multiple intersectional issues that needed to be looked at. And that's how I look at patients, like the way I looked at my mother. I looked at my mother's experience as a homeless mother. I looked at my mother's experience, a mother who had survived GBV. We buried my mother with no upper incisors because they were knocked down. I looked at a mother patients from the way I looked at my mother. A mother who was struggling living with HIV and AIDS. And so there's no single story. And so when I wear my glasses, my glasses are a representation of seeing people the way they want to be seen, seeing patients they want to be seen, seeing experiences of people who, if you look at them and say, oh, women in this community do not like education. And you forget to ask ourselves is what are they being denied that they cannot be able to access education, which is a very good social determinant of health outcomes, health seeking behavior. You look at the social constructs around women and gender roles. You look at socialization around why young boys are actually elevated above young girls. And so young girls are denied so much time to actually concentrate on school. You look at social and cultural practices like FGM 
system, which is supposed to prepare young girls for marriage and for men, and say all these things are interrelated. There is no social, there is no cultural, there is no economic right or issue that is not interrelated to each other. So my glasses are a symbol that when you see an issue, when you see an experience, that experience is deep. That experience is beyond what you're seeing because what you see is just but a symptom. You have to go deep. You have to do a root cause analysis to be able to bring that which is not seen as an obvious thing to understand what are the causative effects so that when you're giving a solution, the solution is long-term, is sustainable, and one which can actually result in long-term change. What did your mother teach you about leadership? Generosity. Generosity with time. The open. Where when people want to speak to you, speak to them at that moment. Try and create time to speak to them. Generosity around my intellect. Is I realize that my skills, not everyone is as gifted as me. We are all gifted in different ways. Generosity in sharing my skills and my competencies. Generosity in sharing my love. The world needs a lot of love. A lot of people say the workplace is not the place of love. I dispute. I believe that the work we spend eight hours in a day or more at the place of work. There must be love that is flowing within that institution. And then there's that generosity has to be ingrained within this workplace. My mother taught me also hope, to be hopeful. I remember she used to say when I go to primary school and my, my dress would be torn and would put different and different types of uh, clothes to cover holes and all that. And she'd say, your, your poverty is not written on your face. Chin up. You know, and this is a schizophrenic woman. And she says, chin up. And I would chin up. And when anyone made fun, like children, because of not knowing, or even adults made fun of my clothes, I would still chin up and I would become number one in that school, you know. And so shame would be on them because I chin up with my, my tattered uniform. I still chin up. I remember how I would brush my shoe. Is it was mandatory to have black shoes. And so we didn't have the shoe, I don't know what you call it, you call it kiwi here. <laughs> and so we'd take cooking oil or, or face oil and put it on a cloth and actually shine the shoe. And then when you get to school, you wipe away the dust. And somebody would think that, oh my God, your shoes have been brushed and they're very lean. And they would never had a shoe paste. It was actually just out of innovation that we shared cooking fat oil and, and facial oil with our shoes. And so poverty is never written on our face. A lot of the times that we carry our um, internal inadequacy, and I say internal inadequacy is the way in which we look at ourselves, the way in which we self-judge and think everyone sees us like that. No, the way in which the world sees us might be different, but the way we want the world to see us, we actually influence a lot. We have no control around how the world wants us to be seen, but we have control about how we, the world would actually look at us. And so she taught me a lot of that. And who taught all that to her? I guess my grandmother, I had an amazing grandmother. There's something around, around generational wisdom. And I think we need to pay a little attention to that. My grandmother also didn't have it easy. She struggled with depression and she died with severe depression. And there are ways in which her resilience in bringing up her children, her resilience in raising her mother. I saw that resilience in my mother. The on her good days, my mother would cook for construction workers and sell. And she'd bring home and at least would have a meal. On the days where her medical condition was not so severe, she would go and look for casual jobs like washing people's clothes and she'd take care of her children. And then at no particular day did she give up and say, you know what, I give up. I'm a sick woman. I'm alone. I'm homeless. I All these things which are just abandoning me. Let me also throw in the towel. She did. And that resilience has actually moved beyond um, her child's generation and it has come to us and I see my own personal experiences growing up surviving sexual violence gang rapes you know surviving um drug addiction as a as a teenager you know to being where I am now it actually is an act of resilience it is an act of resilience that has brought us three generations down the line to be me who if they were alive today to see what has become of me who has become this person, this way, Rimo, because I'm named after my grandmother, she would be so proud and so full of joy. But even you, even you suffer from depression sometimes. I do. I do. Even you, mm. whose energy, you said to me you loved the word energy. Yes. Why? 
I feel like a volcano all the time. A volcano that wants to change this world. A volcano that wants to spread happiness. A volcano that wants to attract good energies of beauty, of color, of happiness, you know, of just radicality in ways in which we do things, ways in which we do leadership, ways in which we show up as women, ways in which we communicate, you know, and that energy for me is something that is very critical. And so one of the ways in which, you know, that I'm speaking about how I know I am, I'm going down is that I usually just start seeing that energy, that the things that bring me joy, communionism, the things that bring me joy, social justice, human rights, I start this, I start disconnecting with them. And unlike my my previous ancestors, like my mother and my grandmother, I'm very privileged to have care around me. I'm very privileged to have loved ones around me who pick when I'm going down and they're able to support me to just reignite me back and to bring me back. I'm able to access good therapy. I'm able to access good medication, even though I've, I've not been on medication for a long period of time. I'm able to access that. And it's very important because my energy is actually my litmus when I am going down. Your shirt is a beautiful color and your nails are the same color as your shirt. Yeah. And your lipstick is yes. the same. Yes. Maybe your object here is the color of your fingernails. Yeah, when I went to make my nails, I was shown an array of colors. And first I chose blue. And my broke said, no, 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 let's just do red. Let's just do red. I am a creator of routine. There are certain areas where I find comfort and I stick there. If you look at my nails in any image for a long period of time, predominantly it will be red because red calls me. But for me, it's a color of distinction, it's a color of blood, it's a color of the human. You know, it is, it is us when we are cut, we, we, are, we bleed, you know. It's a color of life, you know. Every time we have any emergency medical issue, the first thing you say, do we have blood on standby? Because it represents life. And so for me, I want to represent life everywhere I go. For me, I want to be the symbol of life. And I have tried to be a symbol of life in the world. I've tried to be a symbol of world for the surgical communities, for women, young girls, for people who come from low social economic status, for women living with disability, for young people who are disenfranchised economically. I try to be a symbol of life through my redness. Thank you so much, Stella. I'm talking very, very slowly. <laughs> almost as a counterbalance to Stella's extraordinary words. What am I left with? The chair that tells you to be who you are and to serve the tea if it means that it embarrasses the person who's asked you to serve the tea even more when they discover who they've asked. Her tattoo, the vulnerability, the humanness of leaders, the admission, admission's the wrong word, isn't it? The, the reality of depression and Stella's determination to only ever show up as Stella, not as a strong black woman, but as a vulnerable black woman. Yes. And then her glasses. There's no simple solutions. Look under the surface. You have to go deep. You have to go deep. Don't trust simple solutions. And then the picture of her mother. And having listened to the story of her mother, when I asked her what she'd learnt from her mother about leadership, I don't think I was expecting the word generosity. Generosity with what she had, which was time and hope. Chin up. Maybe I was sort of half expecting that, having met Stella. And then the red fingernails. The red fingernails. As you know, I believe that leading is about energy. And, and yes, I think we've just seen energy embodied. A volcano of energy. That word volcano has stuck in my mind. Leading is about being a volcano. So Stella, thank you so much. That was absolutely glorious. Next week, some more objects with another remarkable person. Lots of love, Julia.
To become part of our movement and share your thinking with us, subscribe to the podcast and join the Women Emerging group on our website at womenemerging.org. We love all of the messages you send us. Keep them coming.